First, do no harm. Anyone with a passing interest in the medical profession knows that these are the first words of the famous Hippocratic Oath, authored by the ancient Greek Hippocrates and passed on to us as the ethical basis for the medical profession. The only problem with this is that the phrase never actually appears in the ancient Hippocratic Oath, or the modern Hippocratic Oath for that matter. And that's not the only problem. It's also not really true at all. The ancient Greeks did lots of harm to their patients. Just ask anyone getting thrown into a pit of snakes in the sanctuary of Asclepius. So let's dive into the way that ancient Greek medicine actually worked. And in the process, we'll see how mind-altering substances played a significant role in the healing process in ancient Greece. So where to begin? Well, how about at the beginning? Homer's Iliad is one of the oldest pieces of Greek literature, dating all the way back to the 8th century BC, over two centuries before the Battle of Thermopylae, or democracy, or Socrates, or any of that good stuff. It's early. And at the very beginning of that story, we're introduced to disease. Apollo has sent a plague to infest the Greeks because they've taken the daughter of one of his priests. Now, what's interesting here in terms of ancient Greek medicine is that the Greek reaction to this plague, unlike a war wound, no one actually tries to treat the disease. Doctors don't run around giving out medicine or cutting people open or anything like that. The Greeks just basically view disease as though it's a sign of the gods' disapproval. And so it was in the very beginning. The Greeks saw a difference between injury, like getting an arm sliced off in battle, and disease which was a sign that the gods weren't too happy with something you were doing. And if these diseases had supernatural origins, they also had supernatural treatments. In one scene in Homer's Odyssey, we see incantations used to stop the flow of blood from a wound caused by a wild boar. And we have evidence for amulets and charms being used to ward off disease. When it came to the gods, Apollo and his son, Asclepius, were often the go-to gods for medicine and healing. The Olympian god, Apollo, was the god of many things, music and wisdom and sun and poetry, and most importantly for our purposes, healing. We can see in Homer's Iliad that he's both the god of healing and the bringer of disease, two sides of the same coin. And he's often given epithets or nicknames like healer or helper. One of Apollo's many many sons, was the god Asclepius. Now Asclepius was the offspring of the divine Apollo and a mortal woman by the name of Coronis. After hooking up, Coronis decided that she actually loved a mortal man a little bit more than Apollo. Bad move. And it didn't matter that Apollo could go around hooking up with whomever he wanted. All that mattered was that a mortal woman chose a mortal man over a god. And this had some pretty bad consequences. In his rage, Apollo killed both Coronis and her mortal lover, and he laid her upon the funeral pyre to burn the body. Now, while she was in the middle of the flames, Apollo went in and cut the baby out of her womb, the world's first cesarean section. And that baby was the infant Asclepius. Now, Apollo had to do important things, you know, like make sure the sun worked properly. So he sent his kid, Asclepius, to be raised by the wise centaur Chiron the same guy who educated Achilles. Chiron taught Asclepius the art of medicine. In addition, Asclepius befriended a snake, and that snake taught him the secret knowledge about healing. We can see this influence of that snake in his iconography, wrapped tightly around the staff of Asclepius. Interesting side note here, the staff of Asclepius, featuring a single snake, is often confused with the caduceus, or staff, of Hermes, featuring two snakes. And the U.S. Medical Corps actually chose the wrong one as their emblem. You can see the insignia of the Medical Corps on the left here. And uh, that's what they use as their, their emblem. Mistake. It should be the staff of Asclepius. Anyway, eventually Asclepius got so badass that he surpassed both Chiron and his dad in terms of his healing abilities. In fact, he started bringing dudes back to life from the dead. And eventually there got to be so many people that Zeus got pissed off and killed him with a lightning bolt all for trying to do a good thing. Anyway, after his death, Asclepius became worshipped as the healing god at numerous sites throughout Greece. The biggest and baddest site of Asclepius worship was at Epidaurus, in the northern part of the Peloponnese. 
And another huge complex was on the island of Kos, the home of the later uh, Hippocrates, our first main doctor. Now this type of complex, known as an Asclepion, was frequently visited by the sick in hopes of being healed. Their visit started with a ritual of purification. Honestly, not a bad idea. Getting clean probably actually helped a lot of people with their disease. And then the Sikhis spent the night in what's known as the Aditun, the most sacred precinct of the sanctuary. After they slept, they reported any dreams they had to the priests who would suggest the healing steps based on the interpretation of those dreams. In the meantime, in this same Holy of Holies, the Aditon, snakes slithered across the floor. And these temples didn't just heal people. One hilarious story tells of a slave who brought a broken pot, not a broken person, a broken pot, a broken cup of wine, uh, to the temple of Asclepius, hoping that he could get the priest there to get that cup fixed or healed so that his master wouldn't be angry. So good, good luck with that, buddy. Anyway, can you, get in, can you imagine getting sick and being told to go spend the night with a bunch of snakes and then telling a priest your dreams and kind of hoping that that is going to heal you in the end? Not exactly a beacon of the uh, modern scientific process. I think personally I'm going to pass on that. But as the centuries rolled on, the Greeks began to think deeply about the way the natural world, including the human body, worked. And soon they developed treatments not just for flesh wounds, but for internal disease as well. That's not to say that medicine became perfectly modern. Even in classical Greece, there were a wide variety of people who entered the healing profession. Purifiers used and often sold aforementioned amulets and charms, as well as votive, body, uh, votive sculptural body parts, like you see here. Root cutters used herbs to treat wounds and disease, midwives helped in the birthing process, gymnastic trainers helped with physical therapy, and surgeons sliced and diced their way to healing. On top of all those categories, we have the pharmacopoli, or drug sellers, and we'll pay special attention to these guys as we get into mind-altering substances later in the lecture. If we group all these people together as quote-unquote doctors, of some form or another, Two stand out as particularly influential in our understanding of ancient Greek medicine. Hippocrates, of course, remains the most famous, as his name still tops the oath that many doctors take today. The OG Hippocrates, however, was from the island of Kos, near modern Turkey, and lived from around 460 to 370 BC. Long life, he must have been taking good care of himself. And this was during the classical period where economic and political and scientific thought flourished throughout Greece, and especially in Athens. Now Hippocrates and his followers were credited with developing the Hippocratic Corpus, a series of texts that contain their practical and theoretical thoughts on medicine and disease. Hippocrates is also important because he's credited with being the first guy to believe that disease was naturally caused, right? Caused by actual things in nature instead of by the gods. Now this seems obvious today, but way back then it must have been tough to go against a text as foundational as the Homeric epics. Now even though the first do no harm phrase may not have exactly been a Hippocratic original, it does a good job of summarizing his approach to medicine. Hippocrates was fairly passive, reluctant to use many drugs uh, to treat diseases and instead prescribing things like fasting or vinegar. But while those may not have worsened the situation, oftentimes they were unlikely to help. Although it, you know, in my personal opinion, it still sounds better than sleeping with a bunch of snakes. So let's take a look now at the Hippocratic Oath in its original form. I swear by Apollo the Healer, by Asclepius, by Hygieia, by Panacea, and by all the gods and goddesses, making them my witnesses, that I will carry out, according to my ability and my judgment, this oath and this indenture. To hold my teacher in this art equal to my own parents, to make him partner in my livelihood, when he is in need of money to share mine with him, to consider his family as my own brothers, and to teach them this art, if they want to learn it, without fee or indenture, to impart precept, oral instruction, and all other instruction to my own sons, the sons of my teacher, and to indentured pupils, who have taken the physician's oath, but to nobody else. 
I will use treatment to help the sick according to my ability and judgment, but never with a view to injury and wrongdoing. Neither will I administer a poison to anybody when asked to do so, nor will I suggest such a course. Similarly, I will not give to a woman a pessary to cause abortion, but I will keep pure and holy both my life and my art. I will, use, I will not use the knife, not even verily, on sufferers from stone, but I will give place to such as are craftsmen therein. Into whatsoever houses I enter, I will enter to help the sick. I will, I will abstain from all intentional wrongdoing and harm, especially from abusing the bodies of man or woman, bond or free. And whatsoever I shall see or hear in the course of my profession, as well as outside my profession, in my intercourse with men, if it be, with, if it be what should not be published abroad, I will never divulge, holding such things to be holy secrets. Now if I carry out this oath, and break it not, may I gain forever reputation among all men for my life and for my art. But if I break it and forswear myself, may the opposite befall me. Sometimes I think that, you know, maybe students today should have, uh, you know, an oath kind of like this about how they're always going to obey their professors. Not a bad idea in my opinion. Anyway, just a thought. Uh, guess maybe times haven't changed for the better so much. Anyway, anyway. The other great doctor and writer of the classical world was Galen. Now, Galen was Greek by ethnicity, but he lived at the height of the Roman Empire, from around 129 to 200 AD. Galen traveled extensively during his years practicing medicine, and eventually made it to Rome, where he became the personal physician to several emperors. Galen's theory of the way the body operated was known as humorism. Ha 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 ha. Isn't that funny? Humorism. Okay, maybe not so funny. Anyway, this theory was believed as far back as Hippocrates, and it stated that the body was made of four humors, black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm, and that disease was caused by an imbalance between these humors. Each of these humors was associated with a particular temperament, so black bile was melancholic, basically signaled you were sad. Yellow bile was choleric, or angry. Blood was sanguine, or happy, and phlegm was, well, phlegmatic or calm. Galen published a wide variety of texts, and many of these were used in practice of medicine for centuries after his death. His understanding of anatomy that he gained from his dissections remained largely unsurpassed until the 16th century, about 1300 years. So think about that. His knowledge of anatomy was kind of unsurpassed for over a millennium. So Hippocrates and Galen are two of the titans of Greek medicine. And they're especially important not just for their theoretical developments, but also because they wrote things down. Even though we have the names of, of other famous doctors in the classical world, it was Hippocrates and Galen who wrote stuff down. And it was their stuff that was copied through the ages. And so while there may have been, they may have just kind of been the first among equals in the ancient world, they're certainly head and shoulders above the rest for our understanding of medicine in the ancient Greek and Roman worlds. So, so far, we've mentioned that Hippocrates' main style of medical practice was to be fairly passive. And Galen was really known for his dissections and anatomy, more than dishing out drugs. So, let's then get back to the pharmacopoli, or drug sellers, and try to understand how mind-altering substances fit into this broader story of ancient Greek medicine. So, first, the Greeks used the word pharmacon to indicate any substance that altered the body for better or for worse. So a pharmacone could be as much of a healing drug as it could be a toxic poison. And kind of in a way, that ends up being a fairly good parallel for our word drug today, right? Drugs can be used to heal you, or you can take drugs and they can harm you. As we saw with Hippocrates' treatments using vinegar, there wasn't much of a difference in ancient Greek medicine between prescribing quote-unquote drugs and prescribing a certain diet. And early steps in treatment were offered eating more or less of a, a certain food. Yet more serious drugs did indeed exist, and the history of those goes back, as so many things do, to where we started this lecture, with Homer and his epics. You may recall from our story uh, that we told in the lecture on ancient Egypt that in Homer's Odyssey we see Helen using a drug called nepenthes in Greek to dull emotional pain. Now we mentioned in the Egyptian lecture, 
because we mentioned that in the Egyptian lecture because Homer says that this plant used to make this drug was grown in Egypt. The poppy is of course the plant that from which opium is derived and while it is it was of interest in our discussion of ancient Egypt due to the suggestion that the flower was grown there it's now of interest to us here because Homer implies its consumption in Bronze Age or perhaps archaic Greece. Homer also describes a drug he calls moly, which Odysseus gives to his men in order to protect them from the sorceress Circe's wizardry. He describes the plant as having black roots and a white flower, and that it was dangerous for a mortal to pluck it from the earth. Other than protection, however, Homer doesn't really go into the psychoactive characteristics of ingesting the plant. And for this reason, it's difficult for modern scholars to associate moly with a particular species. Some say it's snowdrop, like you see here, others say S. fond, while still others say moly could be Mediterranean saltbush. While it's likely that the exact identification will forever remain a mystery, this confusion does provide us with some insight into Greek medicinal culture. Because of the way it's casually referenced in the text, you know, without a thorough explanation, it seems as though Homer assumed his audience would understand exactly what he's referring to. This implies that much of the pharmacological knowledge would have been understood by the wider population, something passed by word of mouth from generation to generation. This idea is further supported centuries later, when the 5th century BC comedic playwright Aristophanes makes a joke about the plant pennyroyal. Now the joke's about uh, kind of a contraceptive, but he doesn't need to explain why the joke matters uh, to the audience. The audience just gets that it's about contraception. And so then again, we can see that kind of the audience or the, the population at large would have had some basic knowledge about the way plants and drugs were used in the ancient Greek world. Texts on drugs and pharmacy did, however, exist. And if Hippocrates and Galen were the titans of medicine, then it's Dioscorides of Anazarbus, who's the king of drugs. His Perihiles Iatriques, or De Medica Materia in Latin, translated as concerning drug-like substances, roughly, was the most robust work of its day, and this was dating to around the first century AD. Now it continued to be copied and used, right? This thing was still used up until the 19th century, nearly 2000 years. His takes on drugs and plants and how they could be used were uh, actually used in the ancient um, and then early modern worlds. He organizes his book into six categories of drugs, aromatics, animal derivatives, grains, herbs, wines, and minerals. And a copy of the text from around 500 AD shows how much effort was put into copying these texts for later centuries. You can see how nicely they're illustrated. One of the major contributions of Dioscorides texts, text is that it provides evidence of compound drugs. That is, plants and substances mixed together to create something more powerful than ingesting a single substance. Another takeaway from Dioscorides' text is the sheer amount of ingredients that were considered medicinal drugs in the ancient world. The breadth of substances led to the rise of, uh, of the variety of practitioners that we saw earlier. So we have root cutters who focused on extracting the plants. No easy task. We have records describing how particularly potent plants had to be plucked while their faces were turned away, or only at night, or while chanting to avoid the toxic effects of the plant. And then we've got the pharmacopoli, who were the drug mixers and sellers, just like pharmacists today. And then we've got the physicians and surgeons who would actually treat the patients. Quite a complex industry for something often regarded as fairly primitive. Now the drugs were processed and stored in an equally diverse manner. Many plants and seeds were dried up and ground up into flakes and powders, and often these were then mixed into liquids and emulsions like wine or honey in order to facilitate ingestion and preservation. Animals were also used, especially reptiles like snakes, the, the snakes we mentioned earlier, and they too could be dried up and ground up. Insects, such as the cantharis and Spanish fly, were sold for medicinal use. And it's worth noting that these, like, these have indeed been shown to elicit bodily effects, namely that of priapism. This term 
This is an ancient Roman term, and, and current as well, for having a prolonged erection. Consider it the original Viagra. Except, of course, that an overdose will kill you. The manner of administering medicinal drugs was nearly as varied as we, as we have today. We just mentioned that many of these substances were mixed with wine and then orally ingested, and these would have also helped uh, hydra hydration while avoiding the potentially uh, hazardous effects that untreated water would have posed. Because they didn't direct um, inject drugs intravenously, vaginal and anal suppositories were used when the treatment called for a drug to be absorbed quickly into the body. So birth control, for example, made heavy use of pessaries, which are substances inserted into the vagina. Weird thing is that some of these may have actually worked, at least somewhat. So a few treatments call for things like wax or oil base, which could have prevented the sperm from entering the cervix. Well, even the most famous crocodile dung prophylactic treatment may have been semi-effective, a semi-effective spermicide due to its alkalinity. alkalinity. Honey mixed with drug-like substances was used as a topical salve, and honey still used some places today for its antibacterial properties and its ability to keep wounds from drying out. Washes were made with oil or vinegar or water and used to cleanse wounds. And even fumigation, the burning of drugs to ingest the fumes, was used to administer, administer some drugs, especially for gynecological treatments. The drugs themselves varied widely. Although it's like with the Egyptians, it's probably that only a small percentage of them had truly significant psychoactive effects. Most of the plants described, like cabbage, which for the Romans, they, they wanted to use this to heal everything from hangovers to war wounds, uh, may have helped cure particular issues, but they'd hardly be called mind-altering substances, unless you really, really like or really, really hate cabbage. That being said, poisons were a big deal. Mithridates VI of Pontus, legendary enemy of Rome, was so scared of poisons that he used to take a little each day to build up an immunity. Just like Wesley in The Princess Bride. Anesthesias, or painkillers, were also available, especially for the wealthy. And the famous Dioscorides that we mentioned earlier makes explicit mention of the Papaver Somniferum, the opium poppy. Mandrake was also used specifically for its anesthetic and hypnotic powers, as were the detura plants such as thorn apple. So what do we make of mind-altering substances in medicine in ancient Greece? In many respects, our conclusions are similar to the role of psychoactives in medicine in ancient Egypt. Although both disease and treatment started thoroughly in the supernatural realm, just ask Asclepius in his Den of Snakes, the Greeks eventually came to believe that disease had natural causes and thus could have natural solutions. While Hippocrates may not have said, first, do no harm, in many ways that was indeed his mantra, and much of ancient Greek medicine wasn't so much about psychoactive drugs as it was about foods and plants and things with relatively minor effects. Stronger substances like poisons and opium are well evidenced and certainly used but it's likely that they were a minority when it comes to treatments. And so if you're a regular guy in ancient Greece and your doctor, your doctor Hippocrates might tell you uh, to fast or drink some vinegar, and while that might not seem like the most mind altering substance or experience, I would venture to say that it's certainly better than going to sleep with a bunch of snakes. <laughs>